Smaug the Magnificent. Smaug the Tremendous. Smaug the chiefest and greatest of calamities. What I find so fascinating about Smaug is that he's one of those characters who's iconic enough that even if you're barely familiar with The Hobbit or The Lord of the Rings, you've probably at least heard of him. And yet, despite being such a household name, if we scour all of Tolkien's writings pertaining to this rather unpleasant dragon, we will find that he is simultaneously incredibly iconic, but also incredibly mysterious. Like, where did he come from? How old was he? And what was Smaug doing before his descent upon the Lonely Mountain? Maya Govan and Melanine, and welcome to another Tolkien Untangled Middle Earth lore video. Today I'll be talking about the most famous of all Tolkien's dragons, Smaug the Golden. Smaug the unassessably wealthy. However, before I try answering some of those questions about Smaug's origins, I first need to state a bit of a disclaimer. Despite being one of the most renowned dragons in, like, all fiction really, we know surprisingly little about him. The truth is, Tolkien never stated where Smaug was born, he never stated a date of birth, or hatching, I guess, and he never really gave us anything more than a few tidbits in regards to Smaug's past for us to speculate on. But because it is Tolkien that we're talking about, even these tiny little tidbits do yield some really interesting hypotheses if we are willing to go all the way down the rabbit hole. Now, if you enter the words how old is Smaug into Google, you'll possibly find some article telling you that, you know, he's over 6,000 years old, and he was bred by Mordegoth in the First Age, and he was present at the fall of Gondolin, and he is this ancient creature with origins going back all the way into the deeps of time. And this does sound really cool, it would be a really cool way of connecting the Hobbit to the Silmarillion, but unfortunately, there is no credible evidence to support this, and there is a decent amount of textual evidence to refute it. But for the sake of the rabbit hole, I will point out that in The War of the Jewels, Tolkien wrote, after the greatest dragon of them all, Ancalagon the Black, was cast down right at the end of the First Age, all save two of the dragons are destroyed. And, considering that there are only two named dragons to appear in the Legendarium after the downfall of Ancalagon, one could reasonably assume that these two dragon survivors of the First Age are, in fact, Smaug and another dragon called Scatha, the only other Third Age dragon with a name. And if this were true, that would indeed make Smaug about six and a half thousand years old by the time he's killed during the events of The Hobbit. Except we know that it isn't true. There are way more than two dragons in the Third Age. If you saw my recent video about ten dwarves to rule them all, then you'll know that Thorin Oakenshield's great-grandfather was slain by a cold drake of the Grey Mountains, and so was Thorin's great uncle. This dragon cannot be Smaug, as Smaug breathes fire, these cold drakes don't, but it also can't be Scatha, as he was killed at least 400 years before the War of the Dwarves and Dragons. Also, we are told in The Hobbit that there is an area to the north of the Lonely Mountain called the Withered Heath where the great dragons bred. And this place is infested with many lesser dragons, even after the departure of Smaug. 
And one more thing, both Scatha and Smaug are male dragons, so there simply is no way that they could be the last two surviving dragons of the first age that Tolkien mentioned in the War of the Jewels. Instead, I would speculate that these two first age survivors were an unnamed mating pair from whom all dragons of the second and third ages are descended, including Smaug. However, just before I continue, for the sake of uh, not being called out in the comments by, you know, some super knowledgeable people, I should mention that technically there is one other named dragon who may have lived in the second or third ages and may even have been one of those two to survive the end of the first age, but even compared to Smaug, this other dragon is astounding. Astoundingly mysterious. In fact, he's not really even a character at all. He's basically just an example of an elvish name. In The Lost Road and Other Writings, we can find a series of philological language based papers that Tolkien wrote to explain the etymologies of his linguistic constructions. It's not in any way a story, but if you are interested in a more academic study of Tolkien's languages, or you're curious to know just how intense Tolkien's passion for invented languages truly was, it is worth checking out. Anyway, in those etymologies, there is an entry for the prefix ghost, which means dread or terror. Gothmog actually derives his name from that etymology, but the example Tolkien gives us for a name beginning with Gost is Gostir, dread glance, dragon name. So technically, Tolkien did put to pen a fifth named dragon called Gostir, but apart from the fact that his name means dread glance, there is literally nothing more to be said about him. Anyway, getting back on topic, Smaug. If Smaug wasn't kicking around in the first age, then when did he enter the world? How old is he? Again, we can say nothing with certainty, except that the absolute youngest that he could possibly be at the time of his death is 171 years old. He first shows up in Middle Earth history in the year 2770 of the Third Age, and he died in the year 2941. That's 171 years later. So, I guess the crucial question is, how old was Smaug when he conquered the Lonely Mountain and first appeared in the annals of Middle Earth's history? Was he a new hatchling? Did he come of age by conquering the Lonely Mountain? Was it one of the first things he ever did? Or was he already ancient? Or was he somewhere in between? Well, we know that Smaug could be ancient, like it is at least possible. In The Hobbit, Thorin tells us that dragons guard their plunder as long as they live which is practically forever, unless they are killed. So we can be confident that dragons won't die of old age in the same way that mortal men do. Except, of course, Smaug is killed, 171 years after he conquers the Lonely Mountain. And if we look at the available evidence, I think the clear implication is that relative to other immortal characters in Middle-earth, Smaug is actually really quite a young dragon when he first shows up in the story. In the very first chapter of The Hobbit, Thorin and Gandalf are talking about the Lonely Mountain. Gandalf says that Smaug cannot have used the dwarf caves for years and years, and when Thorin asks why, Gandalf responds with, because they are too small. Now, of course, there is nothing at all that's provable with this sentence, but I guess the implication is that Smaug may have been small enough to fit through those caves once upon a time when he first arrived in the Lonely Mountain, and this is supported a few pages later where we're told that Smaug routed all the halls and lanes and tunnels 
Ali Sellers mansions and passages of Erebor while he was killing dwarves and conquering the mountain, but over the span of 171 years, I guess he's grown too big, suggesting he wasn't full grown when he descended upon the mountain. Furthermore, and you may consider this equally circumstantial evidence, but that name, Smaug, unlike Gostir or Glaurung or Ancalagon, does not come from any elvish language. In fact, the name Smaug is simply, in Tolkien's exact words, the past tense of the primitive Germanic verb Smugan, to squeeze through a hole, a low philological jest. Interestingly though, Smeagol has the exact same etymology. Now, again, this is a long way from conclusive of anything, really, but if Smaug's name literally pertains to his ability to squeeze through a hole, it does kind of suggest that when he acquired that name, he was considerably smaller, maybe, than when we meet him 171 years later. In other words, Smaug was potentially a not yet fully grown juvenile dragon when he sacked the Lonely Mountain. However, it is towards the end of The Hobbit that we get what is, I think, the most compelling piece of evidence regarding Smaug's relative youth, and this time it comes directly from the mouth of the dragon himself. He boasts to Bilbo, he says, I laid low the warriors of old, and their like is not in the world today. Then I was but young and tender, now I am old and strong. And although these warriors whose like is not in the world today may sound like, you know, some very first agey Silmarillion thing, they're not. Within the context of this dialogue, it is pretty clear that Smaug is talking about Lord Girion and the warriors of Dale that he slew 171 years ago. Which means, by his own admission, Smaug was but young and tender when he first came to the Lonely Mountain and conquered it. Now, if this is the case, one might wonder, is 171 years really a long enough time for a great dragon to grow from young and tender to old and strong? Well, it's a good question, but there is one other dragon in the Legendarium that we can use as a reference to try and answer this, and that dragon is Glaurung, the first dragon, the father of all dragons, and one of Morgoth's most devastating agents during the First Age. In the Grey Annals, which are published in the War of the Jewels, Tolkien tells us that in the year 155 of the First Age, Morgoth first conceived of the idea of dragons. We don't know exactly when Glaurung hatched, but it must have been after the year 155, and we do know that in the year 260, Glaurung was yet young and scarce half-grown and his scales were not yet hard enough to repel elven arrows. However, only 195 years later, we are told that the father of dragons came forth in his full might. So, it took just under 200 years for this dragon to go from scarcely half-grown to his full might. Which means, assuming that Morgoth created Glaurung pretty immediately after first conceiving of the idea of dragons, Glaurung would be about a hundred years old when he first emerged, young and scarce half-grown, he'd be about 300 years old at his full might, and he'd be about 340 years old when he died. Obviously, there are major differences between Glaurung and Smaug, Wings being the main one, but this information from the Grey Annals does sync up pretty perfectly with what we are told about Smaug in The Hobbit. 
all the evidence seems to suggest that Smaug was not full grown when he first attacked Dale and Erebor, and yet 171 years later, he was. Thus, I would tentatively make the educated inference that Smaug was only about one or two centuries old when he first enters the story, and so he probably would be somewhere between 300 and 400 years old when he was slain by Bard the Bowman. And so, let's for a moment assume that this is correct, and we'll say that Smaug was about 200 years old when he first descended upon the Lonely Mountain. We know that he did this in the year 2770 of the Third Age, which would suggest that he hatched around the year 2570 of the Third Age. And it just so happens that the most famous event to begin in the year 2570 of the Third Age was the War of the Dwarves and Dragons. In Appendix B, Tolkien wrote for the year 2570, about this time, dragons reappear in the far north, presumably near the Withered Heath where they are known to breed. And furthermore, in Appendix A, we are told that at this time, there were dragons in the wastes beyond, they became strong again and multiplied, and they made war on the dwarves and plundered their works. Now, I do need to point out that there's absolutely no evidence to suggest that Smaug was part of this war between the dwarves and dragons. The only details we're really given about these dwarf killing dragons is that it was a great cold drake who killed the dwarven king. That's Thorin Oakenshield's great grandfather. And obviously, Smaug is not a cold drake, he is a fire drake. But I think the most straightforward way of interpreting the admittedly extremely limited evidence regarding Smaug's origins is that he potentially entered the world at a time when the dragons of the north were multiplying and growing in power. In the days of his infancy, he may have witnessed a number of these other dragons, lesser dragons, without his ability to breathe fire, make war upon the dwarves of the Grey Mountains, and eventually win that war by plundering their wealth and ousting the dwarves from their home. Only 200 years later, and we know that Smaug did a very similar thing to the Lonely Mountain that the Cold Drakes did to the Grey Mountains. And I think this information may illuminate a thing or two about Smaug's personality. I am aware that it may be a little disappointing to hear me say that Smaug almost certainly wasn't some ancient terror, some relic of the First Age. I get why that is a really cool thing to want to believe, but honestly, I think that although relatively young Smaug may not be quite as epic of a plot point as he would be if he were some primeval weapon of Morgoths from the deeps of time, I think he's much more interesting as a character when viewed through this relatively youthful lens. Smaug is so arrogant, and so flawed, and so impetuous. He has such a grandiose idea of himself, and yet he's hardly lived at all in the real world. Relative to the other dragons in this part of the world, Smaug had so much potential. He was, by his nature, a great dragon in every sense of the word, and yet almost all of his life was wasted, lying atop someone else's gold. The moment he loses a single cup from that treasure hoard, he responds with a childlike tantrum, which Tolkien tells us passes description. The sort of rage that is only seen when rich folk that have more than they can enjoy suddenly lose something that they have long had but have never before used or wanted. When Smaug is talking to Bilbo, we see his narcissism 
his love of flattery. And then when Bilbo mocks him and escapes, we see Smaug leave his mountain for the first time to rain fire and ruin upon a town that was only very tangentially related to the burglary. And then he is shot and killed. I don't say this in any way to undermine Smaug as a character, in fact quite the opposite. I think that imagining Smaug as a relatively young dragon recontextualizes his arrogance and his cruelty and his role in the story. He isn't some ancient abomination of the Eldar days, he's not some otherworldly demonic presence. He is a mean-spirited bully. His personality comes across, almost paradoxically, as very human and the negative traits that make him a villain are much more down to earth than they are in the case of someone like say Sauron or Glaurung or Saruman. Smaug is greedy and boastful. He's curious and wickedly intelligent, but he's far too impulsive for his own good. He is perhaps the mightiest dragon of his age, but he's far too vain for his own good. He had the potential to reshape the ending of the Third Age, but he was far too arrogant for his own good. He reveals his weak spot to Bilbo whilst laughing at the mere suggestion that anyone could take revenge against him. Bilbo then relays this information to the dwarves, it is overheard by a magical thrush, that thrush gives the information to Bard the Bowman, and because he does, Smaug's weak spot is exploited and the Great Worm is ended. In my mind, it is these really rather human flaws that make Smaug such a compelling villain. However, just before I finish this video, there is one last thing that I want to say. Because I've heard it said that Smaug is the last of the winged, fire-breathing dragons, and after his death their kind are no longer found anywhere in the world. But this is a misconception. In Letter 144, Tolkien wrote, Dragons had not stopped since they were active in far later times, close to our own. Have I said anything to suggest the final ending of dragons? If so, it should be altered. I think that there are still dragons, if not of full primeval stature. So, although even this still isn't absolutely conclusive, we can say with near certainty that Tolkien himself did not intend for Smaug to be the last of his kind, and if there is a stray line that implies he might be, it should be altered. Those are Tolkien's words. Anyway, I want to keep this relatively short, so that is all for this video. If you enjoyed it, be sure to hit like and leave a comment and hit subscribe if you haven't already to make sure you don't miss any future Tolkien lore videos to come. But until next time, as always, my dear friends, much love, stay groovy, and Navayar Melanin.